Yeah, so he was, a, he was a initial influence on me, I don't know, what, 11, 12 years ago? Yeah. You know, dinosaur training? Yeah. <laughs> Prepare to experience the strongest radio allowable by law. Secrets will be revealed. Nips dispelled. From a studio gym where excuses never apply. It's Super Human Radio with your host, Carl Lenore. Welcome back to another episode of Super Human Radio. This is a pep talk today. We're going to be joined by Dr. Elizabeth Yerth in just a second. Uh, I just have to say that today is October 25th, 2019. For those of you listening to this show 100 years from now, I realize we were so far ahead of everybody else. Uh, I am so sick um, from this cruise, as some of you who have been listening to other shows this week know. So I'm, I don't have all of my faculties. I'm going to do the best I can. You're going to have to cut me some slack today, uh, but that's okay. I have uh, Dr. Yurth here to save my hide and bring, and bring the intelligence. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Carl. Welcome back. It's been a while since we've done a show. It's been a while. A few months, I think. Yeah, so anyway, um, I wanted to talk about these two peptides today uh, because they have a special place in my heart, literally. Uh, I started using IGF-1 when it first came out in uh, around 2004. We got the first IGF-1 before the LR3 and then the LR3 later on. And... Uh, when, when I got sick, my audience knows the story, you know, and I was told I was going to need a pacemaker, and my heart was all messed up. I, I, Adele Musa from Munster, Germany, sent me a copy of a book uh, published by Wiley. And it was, a, it, it was a, a book of the complete discussions and research papers discussed at a Novartis symposium in, I think it was February of 2006, that talked about uh, heart failure and molecules and therapeutic approaches. And lo and behold, I started reading this because I was looking for answers like to remodel my own heart. And I started reading about IGF-1 and I was like, wow, this is really interesting. And this is way, way before we knew anything that peptides could, could do. Um, and the two peptides that I became most interested back then was IGF-1 and then the long R3 version of it, and mechanical growth factor, which is appropriately called IGF-1E or EC, depending uh, what, what camp you're from. And these are two peptides that have kind of lost any spotlight because there's so many sexier things today, AOD-9604. I mean, it's like every time you turn around, it's like, oh, it's a new one, new flavor, a new flavor. But the reality is, that these two peptides deserve a little time in the light because, number one, they really work. And that's the good thing about them. But you know what the bad thing about them is? They really work. <laughs> and they should not be used willy-nilly. And so I wanted to explore this with you and, and talk about these two amazing peptides, IGF-1, the long R3 version, and then, of course, mechanical growth factor. So where would you like to start? So, you know... And, and I agree with you. I think that these, you know, you and I are of the same generation. These have been around for a long time, and we've seen them used before all this other really cool stuff came. And they do. They're kind of amazing in their ability to work. And then we came out with things like that that will stimulate growth hormone, all the CJC and nipomorelin and tesmorelin, and it sort of got abandoned. And and partly because they are more difficult to use, you have to be more cautious with them. But what I think we're finding. In, at least in our practice, is we're pulling these guys back up a little bit more now because sometimes mm. we're finding we can't quite get what we need out of just using the GHRHs and GHRPs. And by adding in something that stimulates the IGF going along a different pathway, we can now really get an accentuated effect, um, both for people who just really want to build muscle because you can, as you know, put on a lot of muscle with these. And, but also we're finding it's got some of the disease states as well. It, you know, and, and the combination of the two is probably – sort of the ideal world, although it's a little difficult to figure out some of the timing. I know it is. And my, so, so depending on who you talk to, most people say, oh, you don't use them together because they're competing for the same receptor. Other people say using them together has a synergistic effect. Um, so it just, 
I, I don't think there's really a consensus right. on that. And that's the exciting thing about it. I want to say something up front, first of all, so that we can say it and we can move past it. IGF-1 is implicated on making cancers grow faster. It doesn't matter if it's IGF-1 that your body's producing or IGF-1 that you're injecting. Uh, and so the use of these two peptides would be contraindicated if you have been diagnosed with cancer, you have had cancer, and you're in remission now. And, and, and the analogy that I gave off the air was it's not like they'll ever cause cancer. Of course, they don't. Cancer leverages Everything and anything that's good for healthy cells, cancer doubles down and leverages those. And IGF-1 is very important for healthy cells. Excuse me. I mean, exactly right. So when I work with my cancer patients, the sad thing is you really have to shut down every really good pathway, every metabolic pathway, because everything that's good for us is also good for cancer cells. So unfortunately, you kind of have to put people into this just really dormant state, which is not great for the rest of life, but until you get the cancer cells killed off. And IGF falls in that same category. Uh, just like we want to block off everything that stimulates mTOR, right? You want to just block every stimulating pathway. And that's not great for muscle building or feeling good. And, and the same thing's true, you know, when you look at, um, you know, the IGF in general and, and the, the, there's the whole dwarf population who have, you know, very, very low IGFs and they don't get cancer and they live forever, but they have frail bones and poor muscle and they have uh, dementia at earlier ages. So, you know, everything good about IGF that's stimulating, you know, you could say, okay, if, if you have very low IGF, maybe you'll live forever, but likely you'll still die of your hip fracture and the fact that you're sarcopenic and you'll be demented. And none of us want to live that way. So and, and, the, and the reality is, and the reality is that the, the proposed longevity effects of low IGF may have less to do with gross, uh, with growth inhibition and more to do with uh, what what signals cellular senescence, which is glucose signaling. So if you have less IGF and you have less of a of a peptide that acts like insulin, and you know IGF can clear blood sugar out of the blood the bloodstream very quickly. People can have a, a rise in IGF uh, uh, and especially IGF one one R three or two from their secretagogues and immediately get like hypoglycemic episodes right. if they're borderline insulin resistant already right right and we've seen that with igf right i mean we've seen people when they do igf and it's one that people who are doing very high doses of igf on a very consistent basis can actually turn themselves into diabetics if they're using that consistently right yes you know so, so you do have to be cautious and and you know and you but using these on a, on a cycle basis i think what we're learning in all of this is everything is a up and down right you, you want to have your your body into a up up and down state and, and we've talked about that with mTOR and we've talked about it with things that seem like igf that there's a, a paper recently published. We we're doing a lot of research trying to figure out what is the ideal IGF and that you probably want to keep a high normal IGF. You don't want to go sky high. You don't want to go right. too low. And just like insulin, insulin too low is horrible. Insulin too high is horrible. There's right. a so all of these peptides we know are a balance. And so I think that's the same thing true of IGF. And I think they've shied away from it because of its risks of cancer and its risks of hypoglycemia maybe we put ourselves in a state where we're now not using a nice medication that we could really use for helping people rebuild, especially people who are coming to us very sarcopenic, right? Who yes. Have surgeries or who have been ill. That That's a place where I have not found that I can get them there just using the GHRHs and GHRPs. So pulling these two drugs together is helpful. When you kind of look at how MGF and IGF work in, you know, in normal people. So if you do, you know, so if you go and work out hard, so you do resistance training and you break down muscle, the, the mechanical growth factors appear pretty rapidly after that to try and repair the muscle. And then as mechanical growth factors kind of drop down, you'll see the IGF sort of come up. So, you know, in, in a normal body, what, what's happening is you're bringing this, um, the MGF basically causes satellite cell activation, the, the stem cells of muscle cells, which are called satellite cells, get activated. And then, and then what appears to happen is the IGFs come in and, and help differentiate those cells. Mm -hmm. So I think they are kind of important to do together. And I know I'm not that not everybody's in that camp, but I think if you look at how they function in normal body, that probably trying to simulate that is probably going to be our best bet. You know, interesting. It's only in high resistance exercise that you see a big surge in in, in mechanical growth factor, uh, which you called IGF one EC, 
and there's a different IGF that appears after somebody's run an endurance race. So there's an IGF one EA that appears after an endurance rate. They're two different things. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we know that it's resistance training, muscle breakdown, and then the rebuild of the muscle that the mechanical growth factor is important for. Our mechanical growth factor levels drop way down after we hit like 30, you know, so it is harder to put on muscle. But is, but is, is a IGF-1 um, EC, yeah. is, that a, is that a downstream metabolite of just plain old growth hormone? So, you know, the... So it's it's, it's really a, a, it's IGF itself that actually turns into the you know. Gets no, also it's actually a downstream metabolite of just plain old IGF IGF, right? right I got gotcha. you. Yes, you're right. I don't know why. I told you I'm sick. It turns into the mechanical growth factor. Yeah. Right. Um, right. And then I think I IGF one EB is just in mice or something, you know, and one EA is after endurance exercise. But one EA has very different effects. So you don't get the same growth effects. That's why endurance exercise doesn't have the same benefit on muscle. Um, right. You know, so. In my mind, I think one of the best ways to use this and what I do is, is you know, post a hard workout, you inject and, and the question is, should you inject it into the muscle that you're using? That's probably the best way to do it, it is mm -hmm. to target the muscle that you worked out hard. So if you worked out your biceps, that's what muscle you're going to target. If you worked out your quads. Well, if, you, if you train back and you want your biceps to respond to a greater degree than the rest of your muscles, then right. you would inject, inject your biceps. Right Half the dose in each. Yeah. So you can yeah. inject it subcutaneously and get a systemic effect as well. Right. So there is a benefit from that from that realm. But, um, but, but, but here's an interesting, and I was thinking about this when, when we started talking about this. Um, here's an interesting argument for why you should do side injections if you want to see greater muscle growth. Mm -hmm. We know that uh, IGF and MGF are also made in the muscle under – uh, congestion. So, you know, right. we, we, the whole blood flow restriction right. thing. Yeah, that's right, exactly right. The reason that happens is because sis, not systemic IGF and MGF, it's not that it, it accumulates to a to greater degree. The muscle tissue itself responds to this congestion and this change in pH with lactate going up mm -hmm. by increasing the intramuscular production of MGF and IGF. So that's an argument right there why you should probably do side injections with it post-workout. Although they have shown that if you do a systemic injection, you will get benefits. So let's say if you are doing multiple body parts and, you know, that, that you still will get a systemic effect. You are right. You target the muscle directly. And that's really where it's going to play. You right. know, that you'll get the satellite cell increase at that site you know, more predominantly. So, you know, um, for me, it's always a little hard. So if I do, you know, a back and biceps workout, okay, where am I? You know, I'm, I'm injecting my biceps, my back. So I just get a little bit confused as to where exactly to put it on those workouts. Yeah, you just got to go systemic like that, especially when you're by yourself and you can't say to somebody, "Could you put half of this in each of my lats?" <laughs> and I, I've actually done that. It's like if you if you're by yourself, you know, going like this, it's like it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. So, so probably that systemic effect is good, but. But then if you said, said, okay, so that pig MGF is going in there and it's increasing the satellite, you know, this satellite cell activation and it's a myoblast proliferation, and then you need the IGF to come into play. So if you have low IGF levels, you know, maybe your IGF levels are high enough from your growth hormone secreted gods, maybe not. But the if, if we really want a big surge in IGF to help that cell differentiate, then we really would want the IGF to come into play probably at least within the next 24 hours or maybe I would say even within the next 12 hours. So I think that, you know, it'd be interesting to, I'm sure a lot of your listeners have used these and it'd be interesting to hear everybody's opinions. I've listened to lots of opinions on these, but it's just if I sort of use it, you know, as biologic simulation, that seems like that would be the best, best approach. Um, you know, I want to ask you a question. The <laughs> holy grail of, of hypertrophy is hyperplasia. Uh, hyperplasia is a phenomenon that pretty much stops happening after a certain age in humans. And, um, it's uh, myostatin inhibition plays a role in, in suppressing hyperplasia, but hy hyperplasia is the gold standard for building muscle because you're actually creating new tissue as opposed to just plumping up an existing fiber. Right. And so, you know, there are a lot of guys back in the day that took trembolone because there was one study that showed that trembolone caused hyperplasia and all the other anabolic steroids didn't. And we're like, oh, we want hyperplasia. We want... Right. We want an increase in complete tissue mass. Then we can blow it up even bigger. And there is some rumors that both MGF and IGF, when used together, can influence hyperplasia. 
But then there's some people who say, no, it, it, it doesn't happen. Do you have any opinions on that? I think I think it does. If, if you look at, so what are you doing with pig, M, the, you know, like MGF or pegylated MGF? I think a long acting is probably better. The problem with, you know, MGF is it's so short acting that, you know, your effect is going to be pretty limited. So, and I think if you're using just regular MGF, maybe it does have to go right to the muscle site because you're going to get 20 minutes maybe, you know, and maybe that's probably on the long end. Maybe it's even 10 minutes. Right. So right. by pegylating it, by adding, you know, the polyethylene glycol to it, we can get a much longer half-life, so we can get much longer effect. But what's happening, right, is you're adding, basically adding these, it's donating nuclei to the cell. You're actually donating new nuclei to, you know, the satellite cells and, and making a, a bigger cell. So it is repair and hypertrophy. Right. And then you add the IGF, which actually causes more cellular differentiation, so now you actually get more duplication of those cells, so replication of the cells. And so I do think if you kind of look at that overall process of the two together, that you are getting some actually growth or hypertrophy of the muscle. Um, so I do think actually the two together have, have that effect. And, uh, and so so let's, let's uh, uh, explain what these two peptides are, okay? So IGF-1, long R3, is insulin-like growth factor 1, right. which is very, very anabolic and acts like insulin, has all these magical things. And it's and it's changed somehow molecularly, so that it stays active for seven days. Does does it attach to the albumin like uh, the drug affinity complex in CJC twelve ninety five, or what keeps it active for seven days? I guess I don't really know the answer to that. Do you? No, I don't. That's yeah. why I, you know I know I know CJC twelve ninety five attaches to albumin and stays right active. But I, I and I, I'm just wondering if uh, but the long R three. Uh, normal I, IGF-1 injectable lasts about 20 minutes, and it's right. gone. Right. Uh, but the, uh, the the long R3 is supposed to have a seven-day half-life. Right. And so and by so, changing that, right, you just change that amino acid sequence by one amino acid, and it's it's given that longer half-life. And that really has to do more with its um, – it's a receptor affinity, right? So it's not it's not binding as much to the receptor, so the, it has lower receptor affinity. But the and so it, it kind of keeps binding. So I think that that's you know that's simply by one amino acid change, you've you've, you've created this huge difference in in creating a long acting versus short acting version. And, and so so we're starting to understand that the pulsatile nature of peptides may be as important as their direct actions. So for instance, we know that some of these uh, long acting um, growth hormone releasing hormones, even the oral stuff like MK677, mm -hmm. they cause a phenomenon called GH bleed, which makes the pituitary kind of exhausted after a while. Like you just can't keep your foot on the gas pedal, but it also seems to make the physiological responses to these peptides the pulses seem to be less effective at doing what they normally do because this approach to having high levels continuously is, is, is counter to our normal physiology. Right. So what do, you, what do you think about the fact that maybe we just need 20 minutes to get the maximum out of it as opposed to these long-acting versions? Any thoughts on that? Well, I think that, I mean, what you're talking about is that tachyphylaxis reaction, right? Basically, you, you, we get, and, and these two are very, you, you have to be very careful with them because you will. You'll completely, you know, make your receptors so you don't respond at all to IGF anymore, and that's a horrible problem. You're safer with some of the things like CJC and Morella, and you can do those five days on, two days off, and do fine. But IGF does seem one that you, ha you can't keep stimulating or you will become more, you won't know, react to, to it anymore. Certainly, the fact that our body does these very short burst reactions in real life, you know, is is indicative that well, why is it doing that? It's doing that for a reason. Right. The problem is that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of other effects, sort of downstream effects, when we produce our own peptides that don't quite happen the same way when you're taking exogenous sources of them. And so, what we found is to duplicate some of those effects, you need to have it sticking around a little bit longer. Okay. So it probably is our inability to exactly all the interesting. downstream things that happen with these. Um, and what they found is when you're doing like the MGF, because they used to use it that way, and it just had it, people weren't getting very good reactions to it. They would get some, but it was not dramatic. And by use, by extending the length of time that it worked, reactions 
people's responses were much better. So I think there's so many things we, when we look at, and there's a lot, there's a lot of things that are like that. We're not sure of all the little downstream things that are happening at the same time when our body produces it, and we, that we seem to be able to get get a better response when we actually change the the length of time when we're taking things exogenously. Um, so I think that I think there's so many that we don't know. Right. What you know is that you don't want, and these are two by far, and it's why we probably don't use them. We use them a lot more in a very medically managed setting because we we want people to be a little more careful and a little more cautious with them. Yeah, these are these are really, and I said this before, and I'm not saying this to be theatrical, or these are really two very powerful peptides. Right. right. These are peptides that can have can have harmful consequences if you overdo right. it. Um, and so, so would you recommend that if someone was going to use IGF-1 long R3, that they stick to a once a week injection schedule so that you, because the way IGF-1 long R3 works, and, and I'm going from memory, is more than 50% of the dose is gone within the first two days. Right. And then that last five days, you're just getting a tail. So theoretically, if you did it once a week, you'd almost be creating this, albeit over the course of a week, this pulse and the tapers. I think uh, what you want to do is more of a twice a week, actually, and then do like a four week on, a four week off sort of thing. But I would do it more twice a week. And that's what I actually think maybe alternating a peg, the MGF, a pegylated long acting MGF, mechanical growth factor with the IGF, and then doing doing like a three day on the mechanical growth factor and a, and a two a week, two days a week of the IGF. I think what you're going to do is see the curve kind of do this. And then balance you up to here. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, kind of like what you do with your testosterone, right? Right. I mean, you know, is that you, before it drops down, you're hitting it again because you're, you're losing. You know, at that two-day mark, you've lost fifty percent. So you know, you want to kind of come up, back, back up, and then stable it out. And I think that way you keep a, a little bit more of a, um, of an effect, still, but still getting the, still getting some pulsing. Um, and then I think you don't want to do it longer than four weeks at a time. I think you do it for four weeks at a time, and then you take some time off of it. And I think that way you avoid the tachyphylaxis, the upregulation where you no longer respond. I, you know, so I think that that, that when you use these, they, they should be done right. You kind of along your training schedule. So on your harder training days, you do the pegylated MGF, you do the IGF the next day. I think one of the places where we are using them a little bit more aggressively is in our disease states. Uh, really? Found, yeah, what we have found, so there's a lot of recent literature showing that IGF and MGF are both really important for brain. This study that just came out, boy, maybe two months ago, I think it was in June, um, on mechanical growth factor. We used to think it was really just muscles, and, and uh, we now know, we see that there's actually receptors in the brain, and we there are some findings that the lower levels of mechanical growth factor, in at least in mice, had that had that they had any kind of brain injury, they couldn't recover. So we've been doing it in our stroke patients with higher levels of IGF and MGF and using them pretty aggressively, particularly with people who aren't responding to other things like just cerebral lysin and some of the other meds and seeing some really nice effects from that. So I think that that's a place to use that's it. That's interesting. That's I interesting. Say, you know, one of the interesting things, I do orthopedics, and so you know, I'm always interested in the orthopedic realm of these, is their benefit in using them with stem cells, right? Because if you think about what you're doing, you're activating stem cells with MGF, right? So right. You're, you're increasing stem cell activation and then right. IGF differentiation. So if you tie them into a stem cell injection, particularly say you have a torn hamstring and we put platelets or stem cells uh, for a torn hamstring or, or a joint because we now know that, that they're helpful for cartilage too. And then you follow that with a relatively aggressive course of MGF and IGF. I think that we're going to see significant benefits there as well. There was a study too recently with ACL reconstructions mm -hmm. that showed that you know using MGF post ACL reconstructions really helped that 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 was really beneficial too. So I think that injury recovery and I think that's a really good place to pull these in and yeah. use them a little bit more aggressively, but for a brief period of time, just not a long period of time. When I when I evolved the uh, three con uh, attachments on my left hamstring. Um, I talked to Bill about it, and yeah. I got myself some MGF and IGF-1, and I side inject. I mean, I went right in the muscle with it. Yeah, yeah, I think and that's I, what I, and, and I, I, that healed really fast for me. I mean, I, obviously the evolutions didn't yeah. go miraculously yeah. reattach, but 
I was back to deadlifting like in a, in a few months. Really? And you didn't yeah. do any stem cells or platelet cells in it at all? Just, just the MGF? And yeah, just that. I mean, back then I, I wasn't, I wish I could have gone for like stem cell or even PRP at right. that point in time. Um, no, I yeah, I, I, it's really that, interesting. Just platelets followed by that and then MGF injections. And you could, you know, as a physician, I can do that at the same time, right? Put some platelet cells into that tendon and, and then follow that with some MGF injections around it. And I think that we'll see really significant benefit responses. So I think that the use of these with biologics is really going to be. Gonna That's exciting. I, I want to take a break. I want to pick up on the other side with that. We'll talk about injuries, but I also want to talk more about other disease states that seem to be tied to low levels of these growth factors. We're talking with Dr. Elizabeth Yurth. Uh, Boulder, Boulder Longevity, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really a mess. BoulderLongevity.com is the website. And if you're in her area, go see her. We'll be right back with more Superhuman Radio. Stay tuned. Do you use protein powder? Then you'll want to hear this. Dry Protein is the single best protein blend in the world, built around what Mother Nature put into mother's milk. Dry Protein is the first human-appropriate protein blend. There's just too much of dry to list in this commercial. That's why I'm challenging you to compare your current protein to dry. Get your current protein and go to thrivprotein.com and see how your protein's label stacks up to dry. For a limited time, get three pounds of dry for $59.95, including shipping inside the USA. That's thrivprotein.com and code COMPARE. Get ready to experience protein envy. Are you still on the fence about Body Protection Complex BPC Oral from DrSeeds.com? Listen to Maggie Kuhn, one of the owners of the Sea Bus Lifting Company, Jim, in Columbus, Ohio. I had been having some bagging tendon issues that weren't injuries, just the things that were annoying. You know, I'm 58 years old, I get older tendon kind of issues. But I call it, a, you know, we really don't got training when we have just bagging issues. We just kind of keep pushing through them. I started the BPC. What I noticed was I was doing did some heavy tricep stuff that um, that would have killed me um, before when I had an elbow problem and I was able to do that with literally no pain at all. Go to drseeds.com, D-R-S-E-E-D-S.com. Use coupon code SHR and save 20% off your bottle of BPC Body Protection Complex today. Whether your goal is to build muscle or burn fat, you'll find everything you need at Redcon 1. If you need help getting a good night's sleep? Try Fade Out or the most popular pre-workout supplement on the market today, Total War. Sign up for their new transformation challenge and win ten thousand dollars or shop for apparel that people at the gym will know that you are serious about your training need a testosterone booster that works check out broomstick whatever you need you'll find the best quality supplements on the market at redcon one go to redcon one.com that's r-e-d-c-o-n the number one.com or go to superhumanradio.net and click the redcon one banner ads today hey this is carl for 14 years you've heard me talk about can see eye drops and they being the reason that I do not need reading glasses at now 61 years old. But I regularly get emails and messages from people who've been using CanSee and having some amazing results. Recently, I got an email from a fellow named Chad, who because he was on dexamethasone eye drops for over six months, developed a cataract. CanSee eye drops actually reduced my cataract to the point where even my doctor has a hard time finding it. I will never stop using CanSee eye drops twice a day. I've been using them since 2008, he says. And you should be too. There is no better way to keep your eyes healthy and seeing clearly than can see eye drops. Go to wisechoicemedicine.com today and get on board, and we will both be looking into the future with very clear vision. You already know the benefits of red light therapy. Now you have to find the strongest, best one out there at the best price, right? That's where Scott Chevrolet found himself. He had to create mitral red lights so you can get the strongest, best red light therapy unit in the world at the absolute best price. And the Superhuman Nation gets an additional discount. Go to MitralRedLight.com and use code SHR to get the lowest price anywhere, plus free shipping inside the USA and deeply discounted shipping worldwide. Go to MitralRedLight.com and use code SHR today. That's M-I-T-O-R-E-D-L-I-G-H-T.com. This is the Superhuman Channel, doing reps with the weight of the world. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. This is a pep talk with Dr. Betsy Yerth. We're talking about insulin-like growth factor and mechano growth factor, two amazing peptides, IGF-1, long R3, 
And obviously, I should have put the MGF pegylated version up there in retrospect because one is long acting and one isn't. Uh, I'll probably add that to the image later. But uh, these are two forgotten peptides. They were like the precursors. They were the peptides we were all fooling around with back in the day that actually worked. Uh, they are uh, very powerful peptides. They should not be taken without um, understanding that they shouldn't be taken constantly all the time uh, because they really work. And uh, they can have some uh, potential uh, negative effects if you abuse them. So talk more about the uh, – th that's really interesting. You know, that that's really where these are going to be the best used with professional athletes who are trying to recover right. from an injury. Yeah, I think I think that's huge. I think that um, you know, and I think that combining them. I mean, it'd be nice. So there's some animal studies showing injecting, for instance, MGF along with stem cells into the intraarticularly has some really significant benefits on cartilage regeneration as well. So it, you know, they used to way back when do some IGF injections intraarticularly. We kind of talked about trying that a little bit, you know, it's, there's not really anybody who's doing that right now, but there's some evidence that intraarticular injections of these might be really beneficial along with using stem cells to help really regenerate cartilage and osteoarthritic joints. So if you did that with a combination, you know, something else may be huge. If you, if you do an intraarticular, is, is there, does it naturally stay in that capsule or do you have to put it in a medium that keeps it in that capsule? No, it should stay and it still actually absorb, have a, a local effect on the on the uh, cells there. Mm -hmm. So it should have a, a local effect. Now, I think we can get right now what we do is just systemically. But, you, you know, and I think that you can get nice effects from just doing that as well. I, you know, right now, injecting anything to a joint that isn't really approved to inject into a joint is, is a little bit you're, you're, you're running a little, uh, you know, a little bit more of that territory that's a little harder to enter into. So I think right now what the best thing we should be doing is when we're doing these regenerative procedures, and I do a lot of regenerative procedures, is that following those with, you know, these IGF and MGF, sort of putting them on a protocol after that would be really, yeah. useful. but really post-surgery too. If you do an ACL reconstruction or you do a meniscal repair on a young person, you know, not too young because you don't want to use this in too young, but at least mechanical growth factor is going to be really probably important to recovery. Uh, Dr. Alan Dunn, you remember him? Yeah. He, he so he was, on, he was on my show like a decade ago. His yeah. website is down now. But yeah, he used to do 20 IUs of growth hormone intraarticularly. He'd do it uh, three, he, three weeks it in a row. Or was it IGF? I thought he was no, he was doing growth hormone. It, his, in fact, his website was IIAGH something.com. It was intraarticular growth hormone injection dot com. He was training physicians right. uh, back then. And he's gone. I, I have a feeling he passed away or something. Or he retired, one or the other. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was doing he had really good success with it. You know, I think he actually had some significant. He had a lot of athletes, and he, and he did some some studies. He came on my show and he talked about studies that they did where they showed that, um, you know, bone on bone, and then they show that blood vessels. So the first thing is the vascular endothelial growth factors start to bring blood in, and then once that happens, you see new chondrocytes start to sprout. Right. And it was a pretty amazing phenomenon, and makes you wonder why. You know, uh, people aren't asking for things like that before having a complete, like, artificial knee put in. Yeah. Well, that's what – it always also amazes me that people are spending sometimes, you know, depending on what doctor you have, do it, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 on a regenerative procedure and then really not doing any of the things that potentially will make that regenerative procedure more successful. You know, right. that we'll talk to our patients, you know, about doing a regenerative procedure and I'll say, okay, I would really like you to follow up and start this peptide program afterwards and people are like, oh, well, that's going to cost another whatever amount of money, and, you know, and instead they're willing to waste the $5,000. This should be tied in together. But you know, you're talking about when, when you're talking about the blood vessels, right? So there's IGF on blood vessels too. That's why right. it's so important for cardiovascular disease um, that we know that, you know, the IGF is, is low IGF is, is part of the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis in, in, you know, cardiovascular disease too. So it's I, really IGF is a powerful a, a power, a, a, IGF is both a powerful anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. IGF one, in fact, Adele Musa once said to me, one of the ways that IGF one may stimulate cancer growth is the complete suppression of reoxygen oxygen species. And ROS will destroy a cancer cell if given the opportunity through oxidative stress. Hmm. And I thought that was really interesting. I was like, really? He says, yeah, IGF is very very uh, anti-inflammatory and anti and antioxidant so it, you know 
We think that, you know, when you look at the pleiotropic effects of some of these growth factors, right? Like we think, oh, yeah, they do this. It's like, oh, no, they do all these other things, too. Right. And and that's why, you know, the, the sort of the low IGF crowd, the, you know, who say, okay, well, we want to live forever and have low IGF. Well, it doesn't make sense to, we know now that low IGF is associated with, with, uh, dementias. We know it's associated with strokes. We know it's associated with atrial fibrillation. We know it's associated with atherosclerotic heart disease. And there are some patients, and we actually follow IGF levels, and it is, you know, IGF is hard to measure, right? It's going to bounce around, but you can get still sort of, you know, if you measure at the same time on people through the day, we can still get a sense of, are we raising IGF? And we have patients who, you put them on all the GHRHs or, you know, Tesmorelin along with Ipamorelin, and their, their IGFs don't budge much. And then you put them on a little IGF along with that just a couple times a week, and they'll see a nice shoot up in IGF. So now I'm getting to a point where I feel like, okay, you know, here's a patient who has, you know, already has a cardiovascular disease history, and, and, and certainly their risk is high, and, and no one wants to use IGF anymore because of its, it's just sort of been abandoned. And this is a group of patients where we should be thinking about these things, right? Well, so one of the reasons that I started using IGF was because I was worried that for, for being obese for so long and having uncontrolled high blood pressure for so long, mm-hmm. you know, because I had this arrhythmia, and they were saying that my heart had, uh, it was enlarged. And I know, you know, I started reading like this book that I, I uh, heart right. failure. It's like, I, I was like, oh, you know, so I probably have some fibro- fibrotic tissue in my heart. Yeah. Because what happens is in an effort for the heart to try to deal with the hemodynamics, the tissue changes and you have cross striations. So it's actually trying to become more resistant to blowing out. But what happens is it becomes more resistant, resistant to pumping too. It loses its flexibility. And IGF-1 reverses that fibrotic nature of heart, of, of, right. of the changes in the heart. I was like, oh man. So like I'm losing weight, my blood pressure's down. I need to increase IGF-1 so my heart will fix itself. That was like my strategy. And it works? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm still here, and I and I moved a lot of weight back in those days, and I didn't I didn't stroke and I didn't have a heart attack, so I guess right. it was working. No, I think but yeah, I, you know, and I really and that's what we, we're we're using a lot. I, I think you know we we are using a little probably less in our bodybuilder weightlifters, although we certainly have people who want it, and a lot in our disease state people because I think it's going to be these people are sick; they're going to have low IGF levels. All of these things, you know, they're, they're the vascular endothelial cells need IGF, the brain needs IGF. And so we, if we don't more aggressively treat these people, we're probably not impacting them nearly as much as we could. With every, you know, we're pulling in everything. We're, we're treating these people with hormones. We're treating them with peptides, and 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 they're still not doing great. And that's where we're finding that we need to go to some of these stronger peptides and and utilize them. And I do think there's a place if you are, you know, if you just aren't getting quite the gains that you want, that you know that you can you can do this. And, and what I would just encourage people is just. Be careful and don't overuse them. And but by using them in in a kind of sane manner, that we you know you may be able to reach a goal that you couldn't reach before. Um, and I I personally haven't used IGF myself. You have, I, but I've used MGF and I like the effects a lot. Well, you know, it's, you you raise a really interesting point. Um, some of the early research on semorelin showed that the older the individual was, the much worse the response was to the dose. They just right. didn't produce as much growth hormone. Right. And, you know, and I know that we've gone from the idea of using frank growth hormone injections, uh, ignoring everything else the pituitary makes, yeah. to, to, to massaging the pituitary to do its job better. Right. But there becomes a, a point, I, I predict, and I'm probably going to find this in myself as I age, of diminishing returns where – Trying to get the pituitary to act like it's young doesn't work anymore, and we're going to have to swallow the the pill and go. Okay, I guess now we have to go to frank injections of IGF one, of MGF, of growth hormone yeah. because the pituitary is not working anymore. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, if you sort of say it's the same thing like testosterone, like you can take a young guy, put him on HCG, and get his testosterone levels to go up, but you're not going to do that with an older guy, right? Mm-hmm. You give him all the issues you want, you're not going to see a big bump in testosterone. So I suspect you're right. There's a point where we can we can't just make this this pituitary start waking up again and acting like it's young, um, you know, and 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 that probably is a different age for different people and different health factors, right? 
but maybe that maybe you're exactly right. There are those people who you know come back to you when you put them on these GHRHs and GHRPs, and they're like, eh, you know, I don't really feel any better. And and it may be the sicker, more elderly people that that they're not responding to. Um, no, you just put them on growth hormone, put them on some IGF one and MGF, and maybe some other peptides that they're no longer we can't stimulate their own endogenous production any longer. And right. so now we have to replace completely replace them. I mean, yeah. that seems logical to me. I think you're right. I think we all like we all like to be we like the peptides because they're so safe and you know and so nice and worth everything. We can really just be super safe and we can get these things to nice physiologic levels. But I suspect there's a point where you can't get physiologic levels with what you're doing, and we no. do have to sometimes maybe branch out a little bit in what we're doing. And and I think that and I do think we're going to find the IGF and 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 MGF pulled into and I you know any of your you know, physicians out there who are listening or, or people who are working with, with, with clients to, to think about these in, in states like that, where you really do have to have to help these people. There's, you know, these really sick people, you, you're going to have to sort of branch out a little bit and maybe, and, and maybe use some of these things that, that are a little bit higher risk. You know, in, in, yeah. in myself, it's, you know, for, for me, um, that, you know, just using the GHRPs and GHRHs work great. It, I know they're low risk. I can do them easily. And the IGF, you know, I just get a little bit more on that side. Okay, well, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't think I need it. Um, but I also haven't tried it. And maybe I would love it. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 you know what? Every time I use the IGF-1, I notice changes in my body. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And I, yeah. and I just got some. I just I just started using it again recently. Yeah. And, and, we, and we hear that a lot, you know. Yeah. Uh, I want to take our last commercial break. When we come back, let's just touch on dosing, okay? Okay. All right, stay tuned. New Mass Pro Synthogen X2 just upped its own legendary game. To distance itself even further from the rest of the pack, Synthogen X2 now has double the key active ingredients. If you've ever wondered what steroid-like recovery feels like, Synthogen X2 delivers. See why others compare it favorably to powerful bodybuilding drugs at Synthogen.com. Mass Pro Synthogen. When you train with it, you'll gain with it. You've heard me talk about the chill pill on the show and how effective it is in helping people who suffer from social anxiety or sometimes when you just want to take the edge off uh, to a long, stressful day. Well, listen to this story from Dylan Goutreau. Definitely take the anxiety with, which I have a long history of. <laughs> Having started out at two milligrams a day of Xanax, that was at eight years old. And so I thought you remember those three years ago. Extremely difficult. Yeah, so I spent about three years trying to find anything and everything I could that would be healthy for me um, to help with anxiety. Because I'm talking, you know, full bull out panic attack. The, the chilpa was the first thing that I found that actually in the middle of a panic attack I can take and it definitely uh, subsides. Go to drseeds.com. That's D. R-S-E-E-D-S dot com. Use coupon code SHR and save 20% off your first bottle of the chill pill. Check it out. I promise this is one supplement that delivers. Men and women, you've heard about hormone optimization. Do you feel like it's something you want to look into? RenewLifeRx.com is the place to start. Their doctors can help you with the solutions. RenewLifeRx.com has a simple process for lab work, consultation, and taking a deep dive into where your hormone levels can be improved. Superhuman radio listeners get 30% off your initial lab work and consultation. Go to RenewLifeRx.com to schedule your no obligation phone consultation today. Feel younger, get in better shape, and be more productive. At RenewLifeRx.com. Quest Nutrition makes bars, cookies, chips, and pizzas out of complete dairy-based proteins. Our products minimize net carbs and sugar without sacrificing taste. Each delicious chocolate-flavored chip, cookie chunk, and crunchy crumble is custom-made to maintain Quest macros. It's time to enjoy foods that work for you, not against you. It's time to enjoy your Quest. Are you looking for a better way to absorb the nutrients you know you need? Do what I do and start your day with Lipospheric Supplements from Live On Labs. Unlike pills and powders, Live On's patented liposomal encapsulation technology transports nutrients like vitamin C, vitamin B, glutathione, acetyl L-carnitine, and alpha lipoic acid to where they need to be, your cells. Visit try.liveonlabs.com forward slash Carl to learn why I take these supplements every day to help me perform in the gym and in life. That's try.liveonlabs.com slash Carl. 
Spit that out right now. This is the Superhuman Channel. Sorry, I was busy hacking. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm actually getting warm. I think I'm starting to run a fever. It would have been cheap. Instead of going going on a cruise, I could have just gone to a local hospital and licked the floor. <laughs> and the, I would have been the same results. Right. Uh, a couple of things I want to say. If you're listening to today's show and you're thinking, okay, so how does my doctor uh, get this information? The International Peptide Society is where your doctor can go to be trained on how to administer these peptides. And then if your doctor wants to prescribe for you, the place to go is in Nicholasville, Kentucky, and that's tailor-made compounding pharmacy. Uh, if you are a research facility, the place to go is peptidesciences.com, and the code is SHR for 10% off of any of your research peptides, but those are not for human use, so keep that in mind. Um, what, is, what is dosing like? I mean, so, so back in the day, there was like this taboo. Like you were reckless if you went to 150 to 200 micrograms of IGF-1 uh, a day. And so everybody was like, no, just 100 micrograms, that's all you use. And I obviously use 300 micrograms a day for a while because I am that jerk. But <laughs> what, what, what is sensible dosing for IGF-1 long R3? Well, I, I, I do think it's it, it's pretty variable. And lots of times I will only do, you know, like 50 micrograms on people. Um, and But you you can probably safely dose it up to, I, I think, on, on TaylorMade's site, they it comes in like 640 microgram per mil vials, and they recommend a 0.4, so what, that would be about 220 micrograms. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I think anywhere from 550 to 250 is probably reasonable, depending on your goals, the size of the patient, the sickness of the patient, so what you're trying to accomplish with them. And then again, not used on an everyday basis. So, you know, but, but I would say we usually are using about 100 yeah. micrograms. And, and on a, sometimes on an everyday basis in our patients acutely, so post a procedure or trying to recover from a stroke, we'll use it on that on an everyday basis, uh, five days on, two days off, and, and we'll do that for about a four-week course. So, but there are protocols where you're going every other day. Again, that's, this sort of depends on what, what you're treating and what you're trying to accomplish. And then, you know, MGF also, I think that the, the recommended dose is anywhere from 100 to 200 micrograms. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, using a sort of a five out of seven day approach if you're using it continuously. So again, for like a four to six week course, using it continuously five out of seven days and then using that, that 100 to 200 microgram. Um, and what you, if you're like, we're doing bilateral biceps, for instance, you might do 50 and, and you know, some people advocate really peppering it around the entire muscle. So you're sticking a bunch of little times. Uh, and other people say, okay, just stick 50 into, into the muscle. Probably makes sense if you're trying to hit different muscle fibers, if you're really... Mm -hmm. About how it really works, it might be interesting to just pepper it all the way around if you can stand sticking yourself a bunch of times with a little, you know, it's a little sub, little tiny needle. Yeah, like when they do Botox, you know, they just right, keep yeah, going right, in right. and out, in and out. And I was like, oh, man, that's yeah, so, it's right. like it's sewing. Yeah. It's a tight, you know, it's a thin needle, so it's really not that bad to do it. So, yeah. you, and so remember, if you're doing both sides, you've got to split doses. So if you're doing 100, you do 50 on each side. Um, and again, protocol is either maybe, maybe do six, four, six weeks of of IGF and then four or six weeks of MGF or maybe alternating uh, on, a, on an every other day basis. I know some of the bodybuilding pro protocols and body, you know, it, which are interesting. And oftentimes people, they've been the great experimenters, right? <laughs> you know, like yourself. We just, I, when I was using these things, I just used them every day. Yeah. And, like, and, until, and, I ran, and until I ran out, until I ran out and I was like, Oh, I got to order more. And then, then I'd have like a, a, a subjective two or three week break, you know? Yeah. And, and I do know that there's there are bodybuilders who are doing that with success, right? They'll 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 use they'll use a little bit of MGF before their workout. They'll use some MGF after their workout, and then later in their day they'll use IGF. So I don't know that we know the right answer to exactly how we should be dosing these. As a physician, we always of course err the little bit more side of caution. Right. Um, but but I you know I, I think it's great that there you know there are people out there a little bit willing to experiment on themselves. You know you you've done that. You've been you know. You've done that with just about everything, that self-experimentation. and, and you know, Safe <laughs> yeah. to do it on myself, not so safe to do it on my patients. Right, right, right. Yeah, but I, I, again, I think that these are two peptides worthy of people's attention because yeah. if, it, if you train, you're a CrossFitter, uh, you're aging, you know, and you want to recover faster, these are magic. These are really 
powerful peptides. They should be treated that way. Yeah. They should be treated with caution. You should be a little afraid. You should feel a little afraid to use them. You should be like, right. man, I really want to use these right. You should feel that way about these. This yeah. isn't BPC-157 where I'm going to put a milligram in me today. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Right. Thymosin alpha-1, BPC, we don't care. Do whatever you want with them, right? But these are two, and again, it's where I... I sort of like, you know, you, you talked about, you know, International Peptide Society and, and they offer a certification for physicians. I, you know, I, we tell our patients, we, you know, we have a medically managed program. We are following you. We're following labs. We're making sure you're doing things safely. And I, and I think that, that, that everything I've learned, I've been doing, you know, IPS from the start and I'm on faculty there. And, and I think everything I've learned is that this isn't quite as simple as when I first thought, oh, I'll just be able to put people on this. And there's two problems with that. Number one, people didn't always respond the way you thought. It's been a little bit of experimentation with how do you right. do things you know and then it's a lot of refinement of use this then use this and then use this so all those pieces finding someone who knows this stuff and works with you can be super helpful so you know if you if you call international peptide society they can give you physicians who have done the training who have spent time learning it's a lot of training it's a lot mm -hmm. of learning and i really encourage people to find doctors who have, who have been trained you know um you know dr seeds has, has has been on the forefront of all this and is and he's an amazingly brilliant man and for those of us who have, who have, you know, we've been doing this now for over two years, and and it, 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 a lot of it's just experience, you know, and, mm -hmm. and learning from other people's experience. So find somebody who has the training to work with you, because you will get better results and safer yeah. results, you know. And of course, be realistic. This isn't something you're going to take and in two weeks go, oh my god, I can't believe how big I'm getting, and that, right. and that's actually a good thing, you know. Yeah. Anything that does that is dangerous. Methyl one tested that back in the day, and it was yeah. dangerous. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, I mean, if you if you use these two peptides properly, you use them consistently at sensible doses, and you're working with somebody who's actually guiding you through this, and you give it some time, you will see changes in your body that would not have happened had it not been for the introduction of these right. two peptides. Right. I, yeah. you and I encourage you guys who are doing stem cell procedures, who are doing regenerative procedures, who are having surgery, find a physician who is willing to maybe work with you, even if they're not the physician doing the surgery or the procedure, who's willing to follow you afterwards and knows how to dose these things because you'll have much better results. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we're happy at Border Longevity Institute. We're happy for you guys to call us and ask us questions. Um, you know, uh, Brian Graham works with me very closely. He's certified in peptides, and he's always answer, happy to answer some questions with you guys. So, you know, give us a call. Look at our website, and, and we'll we'll help you along with that realm too. But, but, but don't you know? Don't ignore the fact that you you can you know use these things to really help you, especially if you're not recovering from an injury or a surgery. These are really great options, I think. Then, think about all the elderly people who have non-healing wound issues. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, you wouldn't even have to inject it; just squirt it on the open wound. I, yeah. I know that's what's sad to me is, you know, is watching these people who become sarcopenic and can't do anything. And you think, oh, my gosh, there is so much you could do. And we're not. Yeah. BoulderLongevity.com. Go there. Ask questions. Ask for help. If you're yeah. in the area, drive and see Dr. Yurth and her team. It'll be worthwhile. Listen, thanks so much for being on the show today to yeah, talk about girl, this. Feel better. Yeah, I'm going to go home and go, go to sleep. I'm a, I'm a boring person right now. And we'll see everybody <laughs> hey, Monday. Monday, we're launching uh, Open Season on Men Monday. John Romano will be joining me for our first installment of Open Season on Men. And it's going to be a story of fathers and sons. It's going to be very cathartic and very good for you guys out there. It's time that we guys start working together uh, to improve how society sees us. Because we have a uh, public relations problem uh, today that we have to fix. So don't miss Monday show. Have a good weekend, Dr. Yurt. And right. we'll see you, see you about Monday.